Welcome everyone. Welcome to yet another webinar from Data Platform Geeks. My name is Amit Bansal and I'm going to be your host for today. Last webinar, I took about 12 minutes to introduce the communities that we run to you. Uh, today, I'm going, to take a, I'm going to make it a bit short. Let's see how well I do. So we started off in 2004 in a city called Calcutta in India, where we precisely had seven people in our first so-called user group meeting. So you could see me standing there with a few folks inside the room where we did something around SQL. I don't even remember what we did. And it started a journey. We didn't even have a name. We didn't have data platform geeks, no SQL server geeks, no data platform summit, nothing at all. It was just a few people getting together and talking about SQL server. Since then till date, around 20 years, we have done a lot of stuff and five or seven minutes are really not going to be enough. But here is the journey. Uh, at some point, we'll share this slide with you, which has links so that you could go and explore more about us. But in short, we started doing a lot of user group meetings in Calcutta and around India. And you talk about the cities like Bangalore, Mumbai, Pune, Chennai, Trivandrum, New Delhi, Gurgaon, Noida, so on and so forth. And organically, we grew as a community. In 2010, we formed SQL Server Geeks. And then that was followed by Asia's first SQL conference called SQL Server Geeks Annual Summit. And in those days, we were only talking about SQL Server. And then came over Azure Data, Azure SQL, and progressively Power BI became so huge. We transformed ourselves and we formed another parallel community called Data Platform Geeks. And we rebranded our conference, the signature conference to Data Platform Summit. So that's the journey you can see. And this is a picture that uh, lives so much in our memory. This was the last in-person Data Platform Summit that happened in Bangalore. And we had close to 1,200 people joining in from 20 countries. So this is a huge contrast that we have uh, without, uh, uh, let's say, a penny being spent on marketing, just organically people talking about our communities, informing their friends and colleagues from seven people to 1,200 people, um, this is a huge growth and we have come a long way forward. Thank you to our speakers, Microsoft, our team members, and most importantly, you who have supported us over the years. So just talking about some numbers from seven people all the way to 150,000 members from 91 countries, and they all represent together about 14,000 organizations. That's the kind of audience we are catering to today. In the Data Platform Summit in-person event, we had like people from 20 plus countries. But look at the statistics of last two years when DPS went virtual due to pandemic. We had people actually coming in and joining from 108 countries. So yes, you hear me right. This is 108 countries. Of course, as we go down the graph, the number of participation from some countries are smaller, but it is still something. It is still valuable, even if one person joins from a country like Azerbaijan. So that's a huge motivation for us. And this year, friends, all of you probably already know, we have announced the Data Platform Summit. And of course, theme this year is accelerating data-driven success. And we have chosen a theme of this athleticism all over our branding and our website. And, and we are very fond of it, just to kind of call it out. DPS is free. That's the first thing you need to know. So Data Platform Summit each year has two parts to it. The regular conference, which is running from 19, from 20 September onwards. And we have the pre-cons, uh, which is from 12 to uh, 16 September. So the regular conference is free. So today, Right now, go to dataplatformvirtualsummit.com and you can register absolutely for free. Let your friends and colleagues um, about it. The pre-cons, which is the eight-hour online virtual class, that has a price tag to it simply because there's a lot of efforts delivering a full-day class. So we call them as pre-cons because they just happen before the regular conference. So pre-cons are also announced. And here are the eight pre-cons for you. And sorry, friends, this slide is not updated because just today we have added about two more pre-cons. So when you go to the pre-con section of DPS 2022, you would probably see two or three more pre-cons being added. So we're doing a lot of stuff on Power BI, Azure Synapse, SQL Server, Query Store, Extended Events, ADF, uh, 
analytics with transact sql power bi modeling spark databricks performance tuning so on and so forth and today nicola is with us so i will uh, make a special mention about his precon which is cracking power bi performance tuning in a day when we talk about power bi we do a lot of stuff around modeling about ingestion about analytics about visualization about reports and what not but wow here is a great topic because i have always been talking about performance in sql server and it's really great to see a content like this which is talking about performance in power bi so if you're someone who's working in power bi and you want to ensure that your reports and your visualizations open up like a firecracker that's what the title says so this is the class that you should attend it's very low priced uh, yet if you want to have a 60% discount code please use this uh, discount code which says 60 steel it that's right on the top 60 steel it so do not forget to use that and you know friends we what we call this as as offering true value simply because we are the only conference where you get to attend the precon live and you also get the recordings of it so you can watch the same class all over again as many times as you want over next 12 months that i think is awesome because i'm sure all of us struggle from this fact that in a 8 hour class we just can't really keep up with everything and we really want to recap the content so thanks to our speakers who allow us to record the class and they allow us to share the recordings with you so make it a point that you register for this class and you can register for more classes because you can even if you're not able to attend them live you can watch the recordings a few highlights about dps 2022 first thing this is the first time we are hosting multiple editions so you have the anz australia new zealand edition the apac edition the ist edition we have the emia edition and the americas edition why are we having multiple editions simply to cater to our global audience in a much better way with five editions we are catering to five different slots of time zones so that the delivery time of our conference content is very conducive to you now does this mean that you have to register five times absolutely not you register only once and you can attend any edition any time that is conducive to you first time ever a great step towards diversity we are having multilingual content so apart from sessions being delivered in english we will have sessions in hebrew um italian german spanish slovenian um hindi so many other languages if i am not wrong we will have content in about 16 languages that is dps special track on sql server 2022 you know sql server 2022 is round the corner and at microsoft build it was announced for public preview some of you probably are already playing with it so watch out for this special track each year content is the king for us our only focus is on bringing fresh new curated content and that is what dps is known for and we are going to ensure that you're not disappointed this year and you feel much better with our content huge technology co coverage we cover close to 29 technologies in azure data analytics and ai stack so there is definitely something in for you if you're a company that works a lot in data analytics and ai space and you would like to help us with some sponsorship and you want to become a knowledge partner you could explore that just go to data platform virtual summit.com and the top level menu has all the links the links to precon the links to booking the links to sessions and the link to sponsorship another big announcement friends just today we have announced the first part of our breakout sessions for the conference so about 70 sessions are already announced you can go and scroll down and you can explore the content that's going to be delivered that's part 1 another 70 sessions are going to be announced in part 2 and a few more in part 3 so overall we will have close to 200 sessions at dps so do not wait after this webinar yes not now but after this webinar you should go to data platform virtual summit.com evaluate dps and register yourself and invite your friends and colleagues yes bookings are open again special thanks to microsoft for supporting our communities sql server geeks data platform geeks and data platform summit we'll share this a uh, lot of links in the chat window so we are all over the place um, twitter linkedin facebook 
wherever you are comfortable, you could connect with us and you can follow us. Housekeeping, a general slide for all of you. I'm sure all of you are so well versed in the digital world today. But yeah, just a few, a few uh, reminders. Use headphones so that you have good experience. Use the Q&A window for your questions. Rest is all good. You could follow us on Twitter at the rate data geeks, SQL Server Geeks, and I am also available on Twitter, A underscore Bunsel. Okay, that's their feedback. That will come later after Nicola's session. So without any further delay, we hand over the stage to Nicola to take this webinar forward. Nicola has been a long time MVP. I know not long time MVP, but probably recently awarded, maybe in a year or two, as, as far as I remember, and if I'm not wrong. And uh, but someone who has been so active in the community, especially in the Power BI space, is one of the most um, world-renowned and respected Power BI voices now. So I'm so happy that I get this opportunity to host Nicola. Nicola, over to you, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Amit. Thanks for this kind introduction. And uh, yeah, you are, you are too, uh, too kind, and I really appreciate your words. So I'll start sharing my screen uh, for the beginning. And uh, once again, thanks for having me. And first of all, congratulations on the journey that you just described from seven people to uh, 165,000. That's amazing. And uh, uh, you and your team did a really great job. So it's, it's really inspiring to, to hear stories like that. So congratulations from my side on that. Okay, so first of all, uh, I would like, as I said, to thank Amit and uh, Data Platform Geeks uh, team for having me today. And uh, yeah, we can... Uh, then move straight to the, into the action. Uh, first, let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nikola Ilic. I'm originally from Belgrade uh, in Serbia, but for the last six years, I live in the uh, beautiful city of Salzburg in Austria, where I work as a data platform consultant and trainer. Uh, living in Salzburg was the reason why I've chosen this nickname, Data Mozart. Uh, so it's nothing related to classic music, uh, being fan of classic music or something like this. As you probably know, Salzburg is uh, worldly famous as a birthplace of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So I was brave enough to use his last name as part of my nickname. And that's why I'm trying to make music from the data. Uh, you can find me on the web. I'm regularly blogging at data-mozart.com. I'm active on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn. So feel free to connect if you like. Uh, Privately, I'm father of two kids and true football and Barca fan, as you may conclude looking uh, on your screens. Okay, so let's start talking about performance in Power BI. And in the very beginning, I'll be honest with you. Uh, creating a Power BI report may look like an easy task. So you go, you import the data, you create and set those nice colorful visuals and your shiny dashboard is ready. However, one day, uh, you receive a phone call from the report users who complain that their Power BI report is slow. Or what's even more, uh, what's even worse, uh, your scary old DBA walks to your office and asks why your report burns all the available resources during the data refresh process. As I've already told you, uh, creating a Power BI report is really not a rocket science. But in the end, there is a huge difference between the Power BI report that just works and Power BI report that works efficiently. Now, if you have performance issues, you're probably asking yourself, uh, where do I start? And that's a great question, believe me. Uh, why? Because once you identify the area that causes problems, you are halfway through the solution. Okay, maybe not halfway, but you can then shift your focus to finding a solution to a more specific issue. Uh, with that in mind, there are at least five key areas to examine if you want to improve the performance of your Power BI reports. And that's why uh, I call this uh, webinar five things to consider. So think of them like five different areas in your Power BI solution that may cause issues. So which, which areas are the, uh, those five? So data model size, first one. So we will go from the back end to, to the front end. Uh, that's uh, kind of a uh, uh, way to uh, think about this. Then data refresh process. After that, DAX calculations. Finally, once we move to the report itself, it's visualization rendering time and storage mode choice. I'll explain later why I put this one in the end because uh, you probably know that uh, deciding which storage mode to use is one of the first decisions you are making when starting Power BI solution. But uh, I think I had a good reason to put it in the end. 
So let's go and try to understand each of these areas in more depth. Uh, I will show you some potential caveats and how you can avoid or overcome them. And I will also try to share some best practices for getting the maximum performance from your Power BI solution in multiple different scenarios. So the first thing I would like to discuss is your data model size. It is so important that in certain scenarios, for example, if you are operating on Power BI Pro license, which has a one gigabyte limit per data set, your solution simply can't be used if you reach that limit. Uh, data model size, as you will see, also affects our second talking point, uh, data refresh process, because as you may assume, the larger the model, the more time and resources uh, will be needed for the data refresh. Uh, yes, in the end, so tabular model speed is based on keeping data in cache memory. Thus, the smaller the memory footprint of your data model, the faster it will be. Now to understand what affects data model size, we need to go back and lay some theoretical background. First of all, when you choose import mode for your data in Power BI, data is being stored in a columnar database, which is called Vertipack. Uh, Vertipack does nothing else but keeping the snapshot of your data in cache memory. And this snapshot can be then refreshed periodically from time to time from the original data source and frequency depends on your business needs. Uh, to understand how all of these things work in the background, you should be able to distinguish between two key components of this underlying architecture. And those two key components are formula engine and storage engine. You can think of Formula Engine as the brain of Power BI uh, because this part of architecture translates, it takes your DAX queries and translates your DAX uh, to a specific plan, query plan that consists of multiple physical operations such as uh, joins, aggregations, filtering, and so on. On the other hand, Storage Engine represents muscles of Power BI because it literally physically goes through the data that is stored in the tabular model and retrieves that data for your report. So in the end, if storage engine needs to go through massive amounts of data, it would obviously need more time and resources to fulfill the, the request. I always like to give this analogy when thinking about, when explaining uh, how data model size uh, uh, affects your Power BI solution. Imagine that you have, so now, we are talking about storage engine and the storage engine needs to go and pick up some data for you. Imagine that you have to find a book in this old attic here. And what do you think? Would it be faster and easier to find it if you have just a few items around or if the attic is in mess and full of all kinds of different stuff like in this picture? I'm pretty sure you know the, the answer. Uh, optimizing data model size is a wide topic which we will cover in more depth uh, during this pre-conf uh, uh, workshop in September. Uh, I will just here list some best practices related to a data model size optimization and things to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, I think this is the most important one. Uh, reduce the amount of data you are importing in your data model and keep only those rows and columns your users really need in the report. I know that it sounds trivial and simple, but believe me, uh, in 90, 9% of cases, just sticking with this rule will help you make astonishing savings. Uh, when I say reduce the amount of data that you are importing, that means do horizontal and vertical filtering of your data. Vertical filtering means get rid of unnecessary columns. Uh, horizontal filtering means, means get rid of unnecessary rows. Uh, unnecessary rows, we are talking about historical data. Uh, if your users need to uh, perform data analysis over, let's say, data from last two years, then you don't really need to import uh, data from last five years. So two years will be completely fine. The next one is also uh, very important, as you will see in the demo. Try to reduce column cardinality whenever possible. Uh, cardinality stands for number of unique values uh, within the column. And in most cases, because Vertipack compresses the data within the column, if you have many distinct values in the column, it's hard for Vertipack to optimally compress the data. Uh, so that means, speaking in uh, mere mortals' words, if you don't need data on a level of granularity uh, higher than day, for example, 
then remove time portion of the date, and that will significantly reduce the size of that column. I will show you in a few minutes in demo, in one example, what I'm talking about. Next one, avoid using DAX calculated columns whenever possible. Simply said, without going into, uh, into details, they are not optimally compressed. Instead, always try to push your calculations to a data source like SQL database, for example, or uh, perform them using Power Query Editor. This one, the last one is also maybe obvious to, to most of you, but I also saw many times that uh, people are keeping forgetting about this. So disable auto date time option for data loading uh, because this will remove a bunch of automatically created hidden date tables in the background. Uh, instead, always and literally always create a proper calendar or date dimension in your data model. Okay, so it's time for demo and let me show you what I have here. So I have a table that contains data about chats performed by customer support department. And here I have 9.3 million rows, approximately 9.3 million rows. And in this column date team start UTC, I just did a simple distinct count of, uh, of the values in that column. And this measure shows me that I have almost 9 million distinct values in, in uh, the column date time uh, UTC. So I will use DAX Studio and built-in Vertipack Analyzer tool within DAX Studio to understand how much memory uh, this column and this table occupies in my data model. So I will go to External Tools tab on the top and choose DAX Studio. I sincerely hope that you all uh, are aware of DAX Studio and are using it. If not, uh, uh, go to DAXstudio.org, uh, this one and grab it for free. That's amazing, amazing free tool that will immensely uh, boost your Power BI, uh, Power BI development. So one of the coolest features in DAX Studio is Vertipack Analyzer. Well, what Vertipack Analyzer does essentially is it collects data from many different dynamic management views and display them in more convenient way, more readable way than if you go and query the data uh, uh, yourself. So if I go to advanced tab on the top and click on this view metrics button. Now I can see different, different numbers related to my data model. Uh, just to be clear, all of these numbers here are in bytes. So I can see that table size, uh, the size of the uh, of chat's table is 551 megabytes. Now, if I click on this small arrow next to a table name, I can see all those numbers broken down on a column level. So I can immediately see that this day team start UTC column is the most expensive one, not just in this table, but in the whole data model. Why? Because it takes 57% uh, of the whole data model or 82% of the, of, of the chats table. And the size of this column is 454 megabytes. Just remember this number, 454 megabytes. And this is the number we saw in Power BI Desktop. That's cardinality, so number of distinct values within the column. Now, if I go back to Power BI Desktop and let's go to Power Query Editor. So I will just do three clicks, literally three clicks. I will choose this date team start you to see column, right click on it and change the type of the column from date time to date. So we got rid of uh, hours, minutes and seconds. I'll hit close and apply and wait for Power BI to apply those changes. So it should take maybe 30, 40 seconds, hopefully not longer than that. Okay, this number should change now. Instead of 8.8 .8 million rows, now we have just slightly more than 1,000 distinct values. And let's check in Vertipack Analyzer if that change brought some uh, uh, savings to our data model. So I will click again on View Metrics to refresh uh, the numbers. And if I now expand chats, you see that date team start UTC column has cardinality of 1,356. And column size, instead of 454 megabytes, is just six megabytes now. So basically, uh, just by getting rid of uh, time portion within our, uh, within our column, uh, we managed to save 90% of uh, memory space. And that's a huge saving. So 
Uh, I would say in 99% of cases, day level of granularity is completely fine for analytic reports. In some cases, maybe you will need to, uh, uh, to group the data to summarize data on our level, but that will still uh, bring, I experimented here, and this brings like 32,000 distinct values and column size is like 20, 30 megabytes. So it's still uh, uh, way less than originally if you keep original date time values in your Power BI solution. So that's when I say reduce the cardinality, try to get rid of, uh, uh, of uh, columns that, has, uh, that have a lot of distinct values. Fine, now that you know how to optimize your data model size, your data refresh process will run much faster. And that's true, of course, but not in 100% of cases. I mean, if it was simple like that, then this webinar uh, wouldn't have existed in the first place, right? Uh, so as I've already explained, uh, Vertipec keeps the snapshot of your data in memory. And you are then refreshing this snapshot from time to time depending on your specific business needs. So it can be once per hour, it can be once per day, even once per month, so it depends. Now, chances are that you are applying some transformations to your data before you load it to Power BI. That can be uh, things like uh, currency conversion, data filtering, renaming your columns, replacing some values and so on. So the question is, where do you shape your data? Source database, that's the most obvious choice. And I would say in most cases, the most desirable scenario, which is based on those traditional uh, uh, extract, transform and load processes. So ETL processes. If you don't perform data transformations on the source side, the next station is Power Query. Power Query is the built-in tool within Power BI that enables you to perform all kinds of transformations to your data. So I'm not exaggerating. So it's really all kinds of transformations to your data. Last time I checked in the official documentation, you can apply more than 300 different transformations. Uh, the key advantage of Power Query is that you can perform all those transformations and really complex data transformations with little or no coding skills at all. What's even better, all the steps you apply during the data transformation process are being saved. So every time you go and refresh your data set, those steps will be automatically applied uh, to shape your data and prepare it uh, uh, for your reports. Under the hood of Power Query is a mashup engine that enables your data shaping process to run smoothly. And Power Query relies on very powerful M language for data manipulation. Now for some data sources, such as relational databases, but also for some non-relational data sources like OData, Active Directory, for example, Meshup Engine is smart enough to translate M language to a language that this underlying data source will understand. In most cases, we are talking about SQL, of course. Uh, what's the idea and why it's so important? Uh, by pushing all those complex calculations and transformations directly to a source, Power Query leverages capabilities of those of those powerful, robust relational database engines that are built to cope with large amounts of data in the most efficient way. And that ability of Power Query's mashup engine to create one single SQL statement that will combine all M statements behind your transformations is what we are calling, uh, what we call query folding. Or let's try to put it simple. If the mashup engine is able to generate one single SQL query, that is going to be executed on the data source side, we say that the query faults. This is an extremely important concept, extremely important feature in Power BI, uh, and as such also deserves, uh, I would say a separate one hour or 90 minute session to get familiar with all the capabilities and limitations. However, I want to show you today quickly how this feature may increase or decrease efficiency of your data refresh process. So it's time for demo again, I'll go to Power BI desktop. And you see that I have a table. Uh, this is Contos effect table. So from sample database that contains 12.6 million rows. So it's just one table in, in, this, uh, uh, in this example. And let's go and apply some transformations to our table. So I'll go to online sales filters table. 
and let's let's apply some transformations. So first of all, I'll pick up some columns from Dim Customer Table. Let's take first name and gender. Okay, so let's now do some transformation on first name. So I will uh, use transform and put all uh, first names to uppercase. Now let's change the type of our date key column. So I will right click on this date key column and choose to change type like we did previously for chats. Uh, I've changed this from date time to date. So we got rid of time portion here. Next, let's say I will calculate uh, sales uh, absolute value of my sales amount. I mean, this, this doesn't have uh, some business sense, but this is just for the demo purposes to show you how uh, it affects query folding process. So I uh, calculated absolute value of my sales amount. Let's do some filtering. For example, on total costs, I will place a filter uh, and I want to keep only those rows where uh, total cost is greater than five. Okay, then let's do a replacement. For example, here in our gender table, I will uh, replace M with male. And finally, let's keep only those rows where another filtering, so where sales amount is greater than 500. Okay, so these are the things I mentioned. I was just clicking here and there, so I didn't write a single line of code, and all these steps are saved here. So every time I go and refresh my data set, these steps will be automatically applied and all these transformations will be applied uh, to my data set. Now, if I right click on this last step, filter rows one, uh, there is an option called view native query. When this option is enabled, that means that your query folds. So query folding is in place. In Power Query Online, we have those nice icons uh, for each step that shows if the query is folding, not folding, or if it's unknown. Unfortunately, in Power BI Desktop, we need to rely on uh, manual clicking and checking if the, the step is folding or not. So if I click on this view native query, let me expand this window. This is the SQL that was generated automatically by Power Query, uh, Power Query Engine. And let me show you here, we have all these transformations. So if you remember, we uh, changed our first name to be uppercase. We uh, changed data type of uh, uh, date key from date time to date. We calculated absolute value. We do replace, uh, we did replace. So all these, our transformations performed in M language were translated, so they have their equivalents. Those functions have equivalents in SQL language, in T-SQL. But the most important thing here is down at the bottom, this where close. Because this literally instructs SQL Server, because our data comes from SQL Server database, this literally instructs SQL Server to give us only those rows where sales amount is greater than 500. So it's, you can imagine, you can just think of it like that uh, Meshup Engine and SQL Server are talking and Meshup Engine asks SQL Server for some data. SQL, SQL Server says, okay, which kind of data do you need? I need this, 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 this column, this column, this column. And I want you to do a transformation here instead of uh, M, I want to see mail and so on and so on. And then SQL Server says, okay, do you want all data or do you want me to filter in advance something? And then Meshup Engine says, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Let's filter on your side and push only those rows where sales amount is greater than 500. So I simplified the whole process, but I think you get the point. Uh, let's close this one. And uh, if I go to Power Query Editor and hit close and apply, let's see if this number is, go gonna, uh, is going to change and how fast it will be. So it loaded 1.5 million rows in like, I don't know, 10 seconds maybe. Now let me show you what happens when there is no query folding in place. So I will go again to Power Query Editor, again to this table. So we will. Uh, the idea is to get exactly the same results, but we will check the performance in this case. So I know that, uh, 
I will now intentionally break query folding. Of course, you shouldn't do that. This is just for the demo purposes, uh, because whenever you identify the step that breaks query folding, try to somehow uh, uh, replace it, or I will explain later what can you do also. So now instead of using this transformation change type from date time to date, I will go to transform and select date only. I will insert this step, I'm sure. And again, you see, we don't have uh, hours, minutes, and seconds. So the outcome is exactly the same. But now if I right click on this last step, view native query option is disabled. This means that there is no query folding in most cases. In some cases, this can also be tricky and query folding is in place, even though this is, uh, this is uh, disabled, but that's, that's not the topic now. So now if I go and check each of these previous steps and for all of them is disabled and this one is disabled. If I go to uppercase text, now it's enabled. So I will click on this view native query option. Again, I see SQL generated by Meshup Engine. And you may notice that we have just this one transformation pushed to a SQL server, just this upper, because it's, uh, it's this step happens before the query folding is broken. But what's most important, there is no where clause here. So now SQL Server doesn't have a clue which rows to send. And let's check uh, now the performance of this data refresh process. So in previous case, it was like 10 seconds. Now I will hit close and apply again. And let's wait for Power BI to reload the data. This number here should be the same. The first thing you may notice is that batches of rows that comes to Power BI desktop are smaller than in the previous case. But what happened here? So we know that we should expect 1.5 million rows. So why Power BI desktop continue to load the data? Because there is nowhere close. So SQL Server doesn't have idea that we want to keep only those rows where sales amount is greater than 500. So what SQL Server will do, will push all the rows to Meshup Engine and then Meshup Engine will apply transformations to the whole data set. I don't need to tell you uh, which of these two options is more performant in terms, not just time. So you see that this one already takes approximately one minute, but also in, ter in terms of resources. So instead of pushing 1.5 million rows, now we will have like 12 million rows pushed to Meshup Engine and then uh, our transformations will be applied. So it's in order of magnitude, the, the difference performance in order of magnitude one, one to seven, one to 10 uh, in terms of time, in terms of resources, it depends on the size of uh, the data set, but uh, it's a huge difference. And that's why query folding is so important. As you see, once it's done after a minute or, or minute and a half, the number here is the same. So we get exactly the same results, but it was very, very, very slower than in the previous case. So listing all the best practices related to data refresh process is really complex task. Uh, therefore, if you identify that your, refresh, uh, that, that your data refresh takes, takes a while to execute, maybe it's a good idea to check, uh, to check query folding. The first thing I'm going to recommend here is a great blog post uh, from Phil Simark from Microsoft's Power BI CAT team, where he explained how you can visualize the data refresh process and quickly identify potential bottlenecks. So you can go to uh, this uh, URL to Phil's blog and download a template file, just change the, the parameters and import your, uh, your data from data uh, refresh lo loading, and you will be able to quickly spot where is, the, where is the weakest point of your data refresh process. Some general best practices in order to speed up data refresh process in general and keep query folding in place would be push your calculations and transformations as close to a data source as possible. For example, if you have permissions to create database objects, uh, you can encapsulate all the necessary transformations uh, within the database view, and then you can import that view in Power BI. Views, same as tables, are foldable objects, so even when you perform all those transformations and uh, create a view, once you import the view in uh, Power BI, you can uh, continue uh, with additional transformations. And if they are foldable, they will also be pushed to a data source. 
uh, query folding is not all or nothing operation. That means if you have, let's say, 10 transformation steps and your query folds until fifth or sixth step, you will still get some benefit from partial query folding, like you saw in this example when our uppercase was translated. However, once you break the query folding, it can't be achieved anymore. Keep that in mind and try to push all those non-foldable steps down this transformation pipeline as much as possible. That means, for example, here, push this one here so that all previous steps then will fold. And this one is also important when you're uh, working in Power BI Desktop, turn off, allow data preview to download in the background option, uh, because when you are in Power Query Editor, you see the preview of the data for every transformation step that you apply. So when you hit the refresh, it's not only the amount of data that gets loaded into your data set, but also a whole bunch of different queries to refresh this preview. And in some situations, these queries take more time than loading data itself. Again, this is happening only in Power BI Desktop, so it's not relevant for Power BI service. If I have to choose one single rule regarding data refresh process, and let me call it, uh, call it the golden rule, that would be push transformations and calculations as upstream as possible and as downstream as necessary. Maybe some of you already heard this. Uh, this is famous Roche's maxim. Roche's is uh, uh, Matthew Roche from uh, Microsoft, again, from Power BI CAT team. And uh, keep that sentence always in mind. That's, that's my recommendation. OK, so now hopefully we are done with those background uh, things and we are slowly navigating to a user interface. And honestly, that is the area of Power BI where performance issues are easiest to spot. And I'm sure that sooner rather than later, someone will come to you and say, hey, why is my report so slow? Of course, there can be a whole bunch of potential reasons, but let's try to focus on a few that are most often responsible for the bad user experience. So once you import the data in Power BI, uh, I assume you'll start writing DAX measures to satisfy different business requests. Uh, for example, you need to provide your uh, business decision makers with the metrics such as number of unique customers, uh, top performing products, uh, running totals of sales amount, and so on and so on. The beauty of DAX, and I intentionally put this word beauty under double quotes, is that you can achieve the same result in multiple different ways. Uh, of course, we don't have time to go deep into DAX logic in this session to explain filter contexts uh, and so on. However, there are certain situations where li really little nuances in your DAX code can take you in the direction that you wish to avoid. So let me show you one very basic but very common example of how misusing DAX calculations can cause a significant performance decrease in your Power BI report. OK, so let me go back to Power BI Desktop. And here I have a total number of uh, these big orders, so all orders that are greater than 500 displayed on a day, day level. So for each date, I have the number of uh, these big orders. So I, I put this here so we can compare results between DAX Studio because I will run my tests in DAX Studio. And uh, first of all, we need to compare if we are getting, if we are retrieving correct results. Don't forget performance is important, but it's even more important to get correct results. Okay, so let's launch a fresh instance of DAX Studio. And I'll turn on server timings this time. I already prepared my measures in advance, so we don't waste time uh, writing everything from scratch, but I will explain the logic behind all of these measures that I show you. Okay, let's start with this one. This is a bad guy. So calculating big orders in a, in a bad way, and I'll explain why. So I'll hit clear cache and run. And now let's wait for this query to execute. Okay, trans. In the bottom right corner here, you can uh, check the elapsed time. 
but it will be always displayed here, so don't worry. And you see that this measure, this measure, this calculation already takes more than 15 seconds to calculate. So 17.7. Let's first check if we are retrieving correct results. So it's 653, 785. Let's check in Power BI Desktop. Okay, so we are we are getting correct results. That's that's good good news. Now, if we go to server timings, here are different things that you can use. Uh, to understand what is going on and why a certain query is slow or or fast and understand query plans and so on. Here, uh, under total, you see the total elapsed time for this query. So it's 17.7 seconds, 17.7 seconds. And you see the time split between formula engine and storage engine. So what's the issue here? We have queries that takes, each of them takes 15 milliseconds, that's extremely fast. But the problem is here, we have 1,097 queries. Why? In this case, I wrote the formula to calculate total number of distinct orders, so distinct count of sales order number, and I want to filter out the data, so I'm using filter function, I'm providing table as in our first argument, and here I say, okay, I want to keep only those rows where sales amount is greater than 500. The problem is this. I'm providing a whole table as an argument, table with 12.6 with million rows and around 30 columns. So what storage engine did, it created a data cache. That's a temporary data structure returned back to formula engine for each date. So we have 1,097 dates in our data model. And for each date, we have a separate query. And in the end, we have 1,097 queries. When you uh, add all those numbers together, you get 17.7 seconds. Now let me show you how this measure can be written. Looks almost the same, 99% the same, but let's check the performance of this one. This one, let's first go to results. We get correct results. In server timings, this time instead of 17 seconds, we have 32 milliseconds and just one storage engine query. And look at this. So basically this part here with, sorry, with distinct count, this here and this here is the same. Again, we are using filter functions. So we are starting the same in the same manner like previously. But this time we are leveraging all function. In this case with all function, we are removing all active filters, either from the table, either from the certain column. In this case, we just need to filter our data based on one single column. So why should we provide the whole table as an argument? So in this case with all function, I will remove all active filters from sales amount column and just put this filter where sales amount is greater than 500, okay? And in this case, by providing this single column as an argument, instead of the whole table, you see the difference in performance and the difference in query plan that uh, Formula Engine could generate it. Third version. Let's execute this one, third version. So don't forget the beauty of DAX, you can get multi, uh, the same results in multiple different ways. Don't forget this. Again, 33 milliseconds, uh, don't pay attention 32 versus 33, uh, it's irrelevant. We again get just one storage engine query. Uh, query plan is exactly the same. Results should be the same and yes, they are. So those two, this one, this one and this one are basically the same thing. This one is so-called syntax sugar because you can omit this part here, filter and all. So all the other things are the same. So you can omit this one, but in the background, even though if you don't write this filter and all, in the background formula engine will implicitly wrap your code with this combination of filter and all. So these two are exactly the same, no difference except in semantics of the formula. And finally, the fourth one, this time we will use keep filters function, which is different, of course, than filter, but in our case should return uh, 
the same results. I something I okay. Go to results. Again, we are getting the same results. Again, we are getting 32 milliseconds, and again, one storage engine query, so exactly the same query plan. And that's why I'm always checking the first thing when I'm dealing with DAX optimization. If there are some uh, uh, filter functions with tables as an arguments, that's a first sign that uh, this can be optimized. Okay, so yeah, uh, as I show you, four different ways to write exactly the same, to get exa to exactly the same outcome. Visual surrendering time. Well, I would say this is, this is the most obvious problem. And when your report page renders slow, you can bet that uh, the report consumers will complain about the poor uh, experience and ask you, of course, to do something. So let's go and check what can be a root uh, issue of the slow rendering in the report. First of all, Power BI offers a very handy built-in feature, which is called Performance Analyzer. Uh, performance analyzer, uh, analyzer enables you to capture the performance for every single visual element on the report page. Uh, the rule of thumb is, as you may assume, the more visuals you have on the report page, the longer time would be needed to render this page. And I'll show you in a few minutes how this looks in reality. So again, it's demo time, and I prepare here a one report page that contains very, very basic DAX measures. So I have just some max, min, uh, average, and so on. So nothing complex, nothing exotic, uh, just simple aggregation uh, functions here. And I have 10 card visuals on my report canvas. Okay, so let's turn on performance analyzer and check what's going on here. Okay, we will not get 100% uh, reliable results because uh, visuals are already uh, loaded into a cache, but nevertheless, we'll see uh, the difference anyway. So in this case, uh, let me, let's just start recording and refresh visuals. So if I or sort now this by total time and in descending order, you see that the slowest element on my report took around 300 milliseconds to, to render, which is, not so much, but yeah, I think that can be uh, much better. So 300, let's let's take as 300 milliseconds as a uh, as a threshold. Now here, I have exactly the same look of the page. So exactly the same numbers, exactly the same design. Everything is the same, but in this case, instead of using 10 card visuals, I'm using two matrix visuals. First of all, credit for this idea goes to Chris Hamill. Uh, he uh, played around with this uh, redesigning and uh, explained how you can spend some time and effort to uh, build metrics that will mimic the look and feel of the card visuals. And in this case, that, that's, that's what I did. So if I go now to start recording and refresh my visuals, you see that the slowest report element took 113 milliseconds. In this case, instead of uh, 10 different uh, uh, visuals on the report page, we have just two. The thing I forgot to mention and what's important for this part, let's again refresh visuals, this is the slowest one. So if you expand this, this visual, you can see how much time was spent in, the, in different areas uh, for visual rendering. Uh, DAX query took only eight milliseconds, so that's quite fast. We know that DAX is not an issue here. Evaluated parameters, forget about this. This is exactly the same for all the visuals on your report page, so that's one generic value. Visual display, how long visual took to render on the page, including if, for example, grabbing uh, uh, some images from the web and so on. But this other is, as you see, 260 milliseconds, which is basically... I would say 90% of the total time. So nine, uh, 260 milliseconds. Now you're probably asking yourself what the heck this other means. And this is a great question. So let me answer it. Other means how long, uh, how long a specific visual had to wait in the queue for other visuals to be rendered before this visual can, uh, uh, could be handled. And don't forget that formula engine works in a single threaded way so 
uh, it can't generate DEX query for multiple visuals in parallel. It's always one by one. Uh, while in this example, Formula Engine took advantage of so-called DEX fusion uh, concept, then uh, it, it's able to generate one single DEX query to populate five different me measures within one visual. So in metrics visual, we have, have five different measures, but it was only one DEX query. Now let me show you here. So if I refresh visuals and go to metrics, there is a DEX query that took only three milliseconds and other is much lower value than in the previous case. Okay, so uh, here is the list of things you should do or you should not do when it comes to performance of your visuals. First of all, reduce the number of visuals on your report page. If you don't need a visual, simply remove it from the page. Uh, also having multiple non-data related objects such as shapes, uh, text boxes, images, and so on, will also ha uh, have impact on your rendering time. Uh, therefore, if you plan to use a lot of these uh, uh, shapes, uh, icons, I don't know what, consider using PowerPoint. Uh, you can, in PowerPoint, you can create uh, desired, uh, desired design, desirable page design with all these uh, elements, with all these uh, shapes, uh, buttons, and I don't know, save this as an image and then set this image as a page background in Power BI. Uh, reducing the number of visuals on your report page also means that, like in our example that I show you, if you have a possibility to satisfy the business request by generating one DEX query instead of five, then you should tend to do it whenever possible. Uh, next one, try to display data at uh, uh, high level of gran uh, low level of granularity, sorry. So Vertipack is really brilliant in vertical aggregations, but it performs much worse on a detailed level reporting. With that in mind, if you have, let's say, a table with 40, 50,000 rows and some measures being calculated for each row, you should be better off keeping this high level of detail by taking advantage of drill through feature. So display aggregated data in the table by default and then enable your users to drill to to specific row if necessary. Uh, if you have a lot of visuals on your report page uh, and you don't necessarily need mutual interactions between those visuals, for example, cross filtering, think about disabling that option in Power BI Desktop. And also sometimes uh, sync slicers option can be performance killer if you have multiple complex slicers on multiple report pages and you choose to synchronize all of them, make sure that it's not the reason for the report's poor performance. And finally, maybe, as I said, maybe I should have placed this problem in the beginning as a decision which storage mode to use is one of the first you need to make when starting your Power BI solution. However, I've intentionally left it for the closing part of this, uh, of this webinar and I think I had a good reason for doing this uh, because I saw a lot of cases when someone thought that poor report performance can be improved by switching to a direct query uh, uh, mode. And yeah, with explanation that, uh, yes, we want to leverage capabilities of those powerful data, relational database management systems that are built to uh, efficiently cope with large amounts of data. And that's, very, very wrong assumption. I mean, those systems are built to cope with large amounts of data, but in a whole different scenarios than uh, working with direct query storage mode in Power BI Desktop. Before I explain why you should avoid using direct query, let me first explain what is a direct query at all. Uh, so when you choose direct query storage mode for your tables, this means that the data is being retrieved from the data source at the query time. And this also means that the data resides in its original data source before, during, and after the query execution. So no data goes to Power BI, it's just metadata. And thinking that using direct query mode will improve your Power BI report performance is, as I said, one of the biggest fallacies. Uh, direct query will never ever improve the performance of the Power BI report, period. Uh, to cut the story short, you should use direct query literally three and only those three scenarios. Uh, first of all, your data size is so large that you simply can't import it in Power BI. 
for pro licenses, I think I mentioned previously, uh, this limit is one gigabyte per data set. For premium, I think you should not face uh, uh, these problems unless you are really dealing with some few billions of rows or something like this. Uh, requirement to have near real-time reporting solution. As we've already learned, when you use import mode, Power BI keeps the snapshot of your data. Now, let's say that the business requirement is to have the data in Power BI report with maximum one minute latency. Obviously, you can't refresh data so frequently to satisfy the request. However, my message to you is don't fall into the trap if your users request real-time data. Uh, ask them what real data means to them. Uh, explain them all the possible down downsides of using direct query storage mode. And from my experience, in many, many cases, users will admit that maybe they don't really need real-time data. And finally, uh, when your security policies are defined on the data source side, as report consumers' credentials will be propagated to the underlying data source and security rules will be applied there. If I still didn't convince you to avoid direct query or you simply must go this way for any of those three reasons uh, uh, we mentioned. Here is the list of general rules that you should keep in mind in order to get the maximum performance from direct query storage mode. The first thing is one huge if so. If you have permissions to do something on the data source, there are multiple ways to improve direct query experience. Uh, first, you can create proper indexes to support your most frequently run queries. Also, you should ensure that data integrity is in place. I'll explain later why. And finally, if possible, create a persistent data objects in the database, such as tables, or even better, materialized or indexed views, which will persist all the necessary transformations and calculations. If you don't have access to an underlying database, you can still gain some improvement within Power BI itself. Uh, the most important thing to keep in mind, avoid complex Power Query transformations, as the SQL that is being generated by the Meshup engine is not always the most optimal one. So it's correct SQL, you will get results that you asked for, but it's not always the most optimal SQL. If you need to use calculated columns, try to push their creation on the source database and keep them persistent. Same applies to DAX measures, avoid complex DAX measures, Avoid relationship on GUIDs. GUIDs is a, a data type uh, within the relational databases for unique identifier. Power BI simply doesn't support this data type and needs to apply some internal data conversion during the query execution, which in the end affects the performance. Here, the solution is to convert this data type uh, within the source database to a text or something like this before Power BI generates its own queries. Next, limit parallelism whenever possible. You can define maximum number of connections that direct query can open at the same time. So uh, if you go to file and uh, options and settings and options under publish data set settings, maximum connections per data source, by default it's 10, you can uh, lo lower this number if necessary, if you see that there is throttling when using direct query. And also apply query reduction. There are different things that you can do in Power BI to uh, apply query reduction techniques. And finally, assume referential integrity. Check this option in your Power BI report because that will enable usage of inner joins instead of outer joins. And uh, in theory, inner joins should be more performant than outer joins. I'm sure Amit knows much more than me about that, but I think he, he agrees on that. Uh, and of course, as a prerequisite, you should have a referential integrity in place within your source database. But I hope that's the case, nevertheless, of Power BI or not. To conclude, the best practice regarding direct query storage mode is avoid direct queries possible. Okay, we covered a lot in this slightly less than 60 minutes. And uh, let's wrap up the key takeaways from this webinar. Uh, the key thing is to identify which part or which parts of your Power BI solution don't perform well. If your data model size is large, consider removing unnecessary rows and columns and try to reduce column cardinality, for example, by removing time portion from your uh, timestamp columns. If your data refresh process takes a while, 
check if the query folding is in place. In case that you identify that there is a step that breaks query folding, try to push it down uh, the transformation pipeline as much as possible. Be mindful when writing decks to enhance your data model with additional columns and measures. Uh, as you saw in our example, if you need to filter the data, filter columns, not whole tables. Uh, also, in some cases, use iterator functions carefully. If your report page renders slowly, try to reduce uh, the number of visuals on the page. Uh, use performance analyzer to identify bottlenecks and don't use many visuals that calculate single value like card visuals, for example. And finally, stay away from direct query storage mode if possible and use it only in those three scenarios we've already discussed. Now, you should keep in mind, of course, each of these points, but if you ask me, one of them is slightly more significant and uh, that is the number one. Why? Because identifying which part of your Power BI solution is the root of the performance issues will help you to concentrate, to focus on solving a specific problem rather than wasting time on less important things. That's it for me. Looking forward to hearing your questions. And this is a uh, yeah, high level overview of the agenda uh, for our September uh, eight hours workshop. You can, if you want, of course, if you like, uh, you can uh, scan this QR code that will take you directly to uh, a page where you can book uh, the workshop. Uh, not just mine, but also the others. There are many, many great workshops from excellent speakers. So the, it's hard to decide, hard decision which one to to attend. And I'll keep, I'll put this one on the screen while I'm checking if there are some. Questions. Okay, I see the question from Anwar. How do we know the data set size in Power BI? Uh, so, my recommendation is to use DAX Studio. That's the easiest way. Uh, you can also write, uh, you can use SQL Server Management Studio to write uh, a query against the dynamic management view uh, behind your tabular model, but it's more uh, cumbersome option. So, if you go to DAX Studio, and let me show you here. So if I go to advanced tab, view metrics, and here you see for each specific table, if you go to summary, you see the, because there are other things that also affect uh, the, the file size. It's not just the table. So it's relationships and so on. In this case, you see that our file is 145 megabytes large. So if you go to Vertipec Analyzer and click on summary tab, this is total size of your file. And you will see that this number is different compared to PBIX file that you see, for example, on your file system on your, on your machine. But that's, that's the correct one. Hope this answers the question. Perfect. Uh, thanks so much, Nicola. Looks like uh, the more questions will come. But before that, may I just take a minute and uh, wind up the webinar because Q&A can continue. So friends, first things first, please give feedback. This is very, very critical. The organizers, the speakers, we always look forward to it. We look forward to your comments, things that we did good, things that we did bad. So we would uh, love to improve and the, and the speakers really appreciate it. Remember, no one is being paid for doing these webinars. They're absolutely free. This is just community work for all of us. So please, please, please do not skip this. The link is there in the chat window. All you need to do is just click on it. It takes you to a LinkedIn post where you can punch in a few comments and whatever your feedback is. That's the first thing. Second, if you are someone who is keen on a deep dive with Power BI performance tuning, make sure you sign up for this eight-hour virtual class, which is happening in September second week. Go to dataplatformvirtualsummit.com. Go to the pre-con section. Look at Nicola's eight-hour class, look at the modules, the abstract, and everything that is going to be covered there. And uh, the, the, and remember, you, at, you get to attend live, and you also get the recordings of those class on demand for next 12 months. Nicola, why don't you just take a minute and talk about what you're covering in your class? 
Absolutely, yeah. So uh, we are covering basically we are starting with data modeling uh, topics and covering things like why star schema is the uh, preferred way of modeling data with Power BI and why Power BI likes star schema. Why should you always avoid uh, uh, bidirectional filters? Uh, then we are talking about data model size in more depth. And uh, with that in mind, there is a question that I will answer that relates to a thing that we will cover in that, uh, let's say, uh, extended uh, version of data model size uh, 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 learning. Then we also cover data refresh process in much more depth, talking about different uh, aspects of query folding, uh, showing some ticks, uh, tricks and tips uh, when query folding will be broken, uh, when uh, when Power Query Editor maybe lie to you, and so on. We will cover aggregations uh, and how to get the best from both worlds using composite models, uh, keeping uh, most recent data in import mode while keeping detailed data in uh, in direct query mode. We will go into more in more depth into DEX calculations, so not just filter function, but also understanding what is callback data ID, uh, why it should be avoided when working with DEX. Then we will also cover direct query in more depth. And uh, there, are, there is a, a very interesting demo that shows how just clicking one checkbox in your Power BI desktop may bring a significant saving in times. And there will also be a quiz with some prizes. I will also leave some surprises for the September. So that's from the high level perspective, things that we are going to cover. Perfect. So, and uh, I'll ask my colleague Satya to put down a link. Friends, take a note of this link, which is the direct link to Nicola's class, where you can actually see the abstract and all the modules. And in case you're signing up, make sure you use this discount code, which is very exclusive to you to our webinar attendees, which is 60 steal it. So whatever price you see, you get a 60% discount on that. And that is just for a few days. We just have a few slots there. The moment they are filled up, the discount will go invalid. So please take your call, talk to your managers and sign up today. With this friends, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. You know that Data Platform Geeks will continue to host more webinars each Thursday at 7 p.m. IST and whatever the time uh, around 9.30 ET and uh, other global time zones that you are aware of. So please give feedback. Thank you so much. Stay safe. And now we will continue with our Q&A. In case you're not having questions, you may want to leave. Most welcome to leave. Thank you so much for attending. And others who are willing to participate in Q&A, I learn a lot, lot from questions and answers. So in case you're willing to stick around, most welcome. Let's move over to the next question, Nicola. Yeah, thanks, Amit. So uh, the next question is from Bamsi, how we can extract time when required after clearing the time? So when you clear the time completely from your data model, there is no way to extract it anymore. But in case you need to keep it for whatever reason that you need to, to keep the time portion, what you can do, you can split date time column into two separate columns. So one will contain dates, one will contain time portion. And that will reduce the cardinality significantly. That will help you make memory saving, but that comes with the trade-off, of course. So uh, that means that you will have a hard time writing measures that need to combine data then from those two columns, not just from one. And uh, I would say this makes sense only for extremely large uh, uh, data models. So don't do this if you have like 10, 20 million rows. N please don't split date time column into two columns. You will have more problems. You will have more problems than benefit from doing this. But if you have, for example, fact table with 1 billion rows and you can't import the data, then of course it makes sense to uh, put the pressure on, uh, yeah, on, on DAX calculations combining these two columns within the measure. Perfect. I guess that's it. And right. Uh, so Nicola, uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you. Thanks was, for hosting me. It was pleasure. Yeah. Yes, of course. It was a, this webinar looked like a roller coaster ride. No hiccups at all and great content. And I'm sure audience has loved it. Um, any final words from you to the audience before we wind up? 
yeah, thanks everyone for joining and uh, yeah, follow Data Platform Geeks on uh, social media and see you at Data Platform Summit. Absolutely. See you at Data Platform Virtual Summit 2022. Friends, all of you, have a good day. Have a good night. Stay safe. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Nicola.